The late 19th century was a time of extremes, marked by innovation, growth, and great wealth on the one hand, and wretched poverty and exploitation on the other. Throughout the, early, throughout the newly industrialized world, the wealthy few received most of the economic benefits of an expanding economy, while working men and women, and even more those in poverty, received little or nothing. These conditions led to unrest, to calls for reform and revolution, and to the formation of workers' collectives and unions. The specter of communism was haunting Europe, as Karl Marx famously said, and he predicted that the powers of old Europe would enter into a holy alliance against this specter. This is the context within which Pope Leo XIII promulgated his watershed encyclical, Rerum Novarum, on May 15, 1891. Certainly, Pope Leo's statement on the rights and duties of capital and labor was motivated in part by the desire to offer an alternative to the proposals of what he described as crafty agitators who pervert men's judgments and stir up the people to revolt. At the same time, however, the moral focus of the document lies elsewhere. And I quote, in any case we clearly see and there is general agreement that some opportune remedy must be found quickly for the misery and wretchedness pressing so unjustly on the majority of the working class. For the ancient workingmen's guilds were abolished in the last century and no other protective organization took their place. Public institutions and laws set aside the ancient religion. Hence, by degrees, it has come to pass that working men have been surrendered, isolated, and helpless to the hard-heartedness of employers and the greed of unchecked competition. To this must be added that the hiring of labor and the conduct of trade are concentrated in the hands of comparatively few, so that a small number of very rich men have been able to lay upon the teeming masses of the laboring poor a yoke little better than that of slavery itself. Over the next 40 years, Catholic clergy and scholars, working closely with working men and women and public officials, began to develop what Leo's successor, Pius XI, called a, a Catholic social science focused on the rights of labor. But then the world changed through the crisis of World War II and in a more positive way through the New Deal, the Great Society, and the very considerable accomplishments of organized labor and its allies. In the United States, the working class flourished as never before, and the gap between the wealthy and everyone else began to shrink. Europeans, recovering from the more extensive damage of the wartime years, nonetheless began to recover as well. In this context, the social encyclicals, beginning with John XXIII's encyclical Mater et Magistra, began to focus the, on the situation of those nations and peoples who were left out of the post-war boom, on the need for development, and eventually the challenges of globalization. At the same time, Pius's Catholic social science was progressively transformed into a coherent body of doctrine, Catholic social teaching, developed in response to the challenges of a new world order, and more recently, the urgent challenge of the environmental crisis. And now the world has changed again. Beginning in the 1970s and continuing remorselessly up to the present day, the working class, at least in this country, has once again lost ground through the erosion of wages, the loss of stable, secure jobs, and the progressive unraveling of the safety net. Not only that, men and women who had once taken pride in their contributions to a vibrant economic and social life have now been pushed to the margins of society. Their opinions and values are discounted, and their interests are set aside by their traditional allies as well as their traditional enemies. While we cannot say that working class anger was solely responsible for the election of Donald Trump, it certainly played a key role, expressed through the support of working class whites and also by the low turnout on the part of working class African Americans. In this context, the words of Pius XI in Quadragesima Anno are once again relevant for toward the close of the 19th century, the new kind of economic life that had arisen and the developments of industry had gone to the point in most countries 
that human society was clearly being divided more and more into two classes. One class, very small in number, was enjoying almost all the advantages which modern inventions so abundantly provided. The other, embracing the huge multitude of working people, oppressed by wretched poverty, was vainly seeking escape from the straits wherein it stood. Quite agreeable, of course, was this state of things to those who thought their abundant riches the result of inevitable economic laws. And accordingly, as if it were for charity to veil the violation of justice, wanted the whole care of supporting the poor, committed to charity alone. In my remarks this evening, I will offer some reflections on the contemporary situation of the working class seen in the light of Catholic social teaching. This is obviously a very large topic, and I am not going to try to offer it, to cover it in any comprehensive way. My aims are very modest. I hope to promote a conversation on this vitally important topic, which has been relatively neglected among those working in the field of Christian ethics. In order to keep my remarks within reasonable bounds, I limit myself to considering the situation of the working class in the United States. I should add that my remarks this evening are frankly Catholic and frankly selective. Christian ethics today is robustly ecumenical, and Catholic social ethics itself has developed in a context of responsiveness to other perspectives. In that spirit, I want to call attention to some resources within my own Catholic tradition for addressing these challenges in the hope that these will prove to be valuable contributions to ecumenical reflection and public discourse. At the same time, I do not attempt to draw on the whole field of Catholic social teaching, and in that way my remarks are selective. As I have already indicated, the earliest phase of this teaching is the most relevant to the issues at hand, and, that, and much of what I have to say will be drawn from this period. Before moving on to the main body of my lecture, I want to take a few minutes to say something more about the working class in this country and correlatively to say something about justice and injustice in this context. Let me begin by offering a rough, a rough sketch of the overall structure of our society. At the extremes, we find those who most often attract our attention, the poor, comprising about 30% of the population, and the very rich, the proverbial 1%. Just below the 1% are those in the top 20% of income distribution, identified by the feminist legal scholar Joan Williams as the professional managerial class. Between the poor and the moderately rich are the roughly 50% of Americans who fall within the middling range of income distribution. As Williams rightly points out, these are the true middle class. But since we all think we're middle class, it is perhaps most helpful to identify them with the working class. The most salient difference between working and professional classes is educational attainment, since most professional and managerial jobs require at least a four-year college degree. At the same time, working class men and women occupy a wide range of positions, calling for correspondingly diverse levels of training and expertise. At this point, the working class is predominantly white. However, if current demographic trends continue, the working class will be predominantly African American and Hispanic by about 2020. So the composition is changing very quickly. As we all know by now, the working class is angry. While the occasions for and the expressions of this anger are complex, it is grounded in long-standing experiences of economic decline and cultural marginalization. Economic inequality is growing by every measure, including both shares of income and holdings of wealth. And the United States has one of the lowest rates of social mobility of any industrialized country. What is more, men and women in the working class have experienced the progressive loss of economic stability at the same time as the economy as a whole has expanded. In the words of the political analyst Thomas Frank, according to official measurements, the last few years have been a time of brisk prosperity. Prosper productivity advances all the time. For those who work for a living, however, nothing seems to improve. Wages do not grow. Median income is still well below where it was in 2007. 
Workers' share of the gross national, national product hit a record low in 2011, and it stayed there right through the recovery. It is there to this day. Economists now regard it as a quasi-permanent development. He goes on to observe that from the middle of the Depression until 1980, the lower 90% of the population in terms of income took home some 70% of the growth of the country's income. Look at the same numbers beginning in 1997, and I'm quoting Frank again. From the beginning of the new economy boom to the present, and you find that this same group, the American people, pocketed none of America's income growth at all. Their share of the good times was zero. Add to this a steady decline in the quality of jobs, subjecting men and women to uncertain hours for few or no benefits, and working class anger becomes all too comprehensible. But is this anger fully reasonable? To put the question in another way, do these developments reflect injustices or simply misfortunes? According to many observers, the changing nature of working class employment and the decline in working class fortunes are the results of dynamics which cannot be changed. Globalization and the rise of technology have made it impossible to sustain the kinds of industries that once sustained the working class. This being so, American workers cannot expect security and prosperity without greater levels of education, this usually being identified with a four-year college degree. We, in, in effect, members of the working class are told that their problems are largely their fault. If they had better education, less, uh, if they were better educated, less encumbered with family obligations, more prepared to move at a moment's notice, they would have a greater share of the prosperity they see around them. It would go well beyond the scope of this lecture to examine this narrative in any detail. It has been challenged at a number of points by prominent economists and social theorists who question our easy assumptions about the inevitability of working class decline. Certainly globalization and technological change have created challenges although perhaps not such unprecedented challenges as we assume. That does not mean that we are simply powerless in the face of these changes. Sophisticated economic systems have considerable resources for generating alternative forms of employment, managing the effects of technology, and constraining the power of large corporations. Many other nations faced with similar challenges have managed to compete in a global economy without undercutting their working force. Germany is very often mentioned in this context. As for the charge that American workers are somehow to blame for their own misfortunes, we need only observe that the growth of inequality took place at the same time as the productivity of the average American worker was rising, together with the average number of hours worked per week. Whatever explanation we give for workers' declining share in the growth of the economy, we cannot attribute this phenomenon to the poor quality or insufficiency of, work, of the work itself. The American workers' share in prosperity is not commensurate with their contribution to that property, prosperity. The claim that American workers need more education has a kernel of truth. There is indeed much to be said for expanding opportunities for multiple kinds of professional formation and training. But as the labor lawyer Thomas Geoghegan points out, the typical workplace in America is not set up in such a way as to either offer these opportunities or to reward individuals for taking advantage of them. Pay scales in American workplaces are set at uniformly low levels with few or no incentives for higher skills and competencies. Again, Germany, with its long tradition of apprenticeships and on-the-job training, offers a powerful counterexample to the claim that nothing can be done here. The U.S. economy functions in such a way as to exclude working Americans from almost any share in the growth of income and wealth that we as a nation have recently experienced. At the same time, working men and women have had to cope with growing job insecurity, longer hours, unpredictable schedules, and the erosion of health care and pensions. It is no longer the case that a life of hard work and careful management will lead to a secure old age and the chance to give one's children a good start in life. These states of affairs look very much like oppression, and to a considerable extent they are oppression. 
Admittedly, most of those in control of economic and political institutions probably do not think in those terms. Nonetheless, they have promoted policies which have cumulatively had a devastating effect on the working class and have done little or nothing to mitigate the effects of these policies. Those of us who work in the field of Christian ethics have a responsibility to reflect on and to speak out for justice for the working class. This is a, a point at which Catholic social teaching selectively read can make a real contribution by providing starting points for a conversation about workers' justice and Christian principles in today's society. In what follows, I want to identify and comment on three such points. And the first of these is the moral salience of class. Beginning with Rerum Novarum, early Catholic social teachings give a central place to class structures and to the rights and duties associated with one's role as a member of a given class. This emphasis may not strike us as worth comment, it may even strike us as a little retrograde, but seen in the context and the aims of the time, it reflects a distinctive approach to social and moral analysis that I think is worth retrieval. Recall that Leo's encyclical is meant in part as a response to Karl Marx. We can imagine a response of the kind that Marx himself seems to have anticipated, framed in terms of ancient traditions of mutuality and deference, in accordance with the fixed orders of society. But this is not the line that Leo and his successors take. In a sense, he brings the fight to Marx's own grounds by framing his arguments in terms of the rights, duties, and just claims of two classes, the wealthy and the working class. He does not accept Marx's view that these classes are necessarily in conflict, nor much less does he think that world history unfolds through class struggle in a deterministic way. At the same time, however, he, re he recognizes that the divisions of class are grounded in a differentiation of roles in the process of production. And so he remarks, social and public life can only be maintained by means of various kinds of capacity for business and the playing of many parts, and each individual as a rule chooses the part which, his own particular, which suits his own particular domestic condition. This is a very telling sentence. Leo believes that the divisions of society are grounded in natural differences of constitution and ability, but this does not mean that any one individual is destined by God to, to occupy any particular place in a differentiated society. The structures of social class provide a framework for economic and cultural production and exchange, but if they are functioning properly, they also allow individual men and women freedom of action and social mobility. Through his naturalistic interpretation of class divisions, Leo opens up a space for the moral critique of the actual class arrangements obtaining in a given society, while avoiding the charge that traditional religion simply counsels being happy with one's lot. At the same time, the structured processes of production give rise to distinctive moral claims, grounded in general principles, but qualified by the exigencies and constraints of productive work. These claims are, mo are mediated through the class system, functioning as a set of interlocking roles, each with its own obligations and claims. The obligations of the worker, as Leo describes them, are comprised of the traditional duties of non-maleficence, including an obligation to carry out one's agreed upon work. Wealthy owners and employers, for their part, are obliged, first of all, and I quote, not to look upon their work people as their bondsmen, but to respect in everyone his dignity as a person ennobled by Christian character. At the same time, employers and workers, as members of their respective classes, also enjoy rights which political authorities are bound to uphold. The workers, being less powerful, have a greater claim on the state in this regard. Where there is a question of defending the rights of individuals, and I quote again, the poor and badly off have a claim to special consideration. The richer class have many ways of shielding themselves and stand less in need of help from the state. And it is for this reason that wage earners, since they mostly belong in the mass of the needy, should be specially cared for and protected by the government. 
Leo goes on to qualify the initial claim that workers are bound to fulfill their agreements, calling attention to the ways in which disparities of power can undermine workers' freedom of, re of negotiation. There underlies a dictate of natural justice more imperious and ancient than any bargain between man and man, namely that wages ought not to be insufficient to support a frugal and well-behaved wage earner. If through necessity or fear of a worse evil, the workman accepts harder conditions because an employer or contractor will offer him no better, he is made the victim of force and injustice. I have focused on Rerum Novarum so far because Leo's analysis of class as a social and moral category provides the necessary framework for further work on workers' rights and social justice. I now turn to a second point at which the Catholic social tradition offers starting points for thinking about these matters. I'm referring to the contested concept of property, the right to private ownership, and the ultimate purpose of created things. In the course of developing an alternative to Marx's vision of society, Leo devotes considerable attention to defending a natural right to private property. Now on this point, Rerum Novarum conceals a tension within the Catholic moral tradition. As a point of official Catholic teaching, the existence of a natural right to private ownership only goes back to the 14th century. Up until almost the end of the 13th century, nearly every Catholic theologian held that private property is established through social convictions or legal enactments of some kind. This discrepancy does not necessarily imply that the modern Catholic teaching is mistaken, but it does suggest a need to reconsider the right to private property, especially given the, the, the elusive nature of the concept of property, especially in contemporary circumstances. We are not in a position to carry out that task now. However, it is worth our while to look more closely at traditional and modern views on property. While medieval theologians did not defend a natural right to private property, they did hold that private ownership is legitimate. Nonetheless, they were not enthusiastic about it. Most fundamentally, private property is problematic because it represents a departure from the supposedly unchangeable natural law. There is a more specific problem. It is not just that private property is conventional. Theologians in this period associated property, dominion over things, with lordship, dominion over people. The natural order of things, if we lived in a true and ideal state of nature, would include both common ownership and equality of status, and these two are linked. Without private property, men and women would not have the means to lord it over others. In the world as it is, however, poverty and dependence very often go together with servile status, and this is at least a tension, if not a contradiction, to the, uh, to the ideal natural law. Until the latter part of the 13th century, medieval theologians generally justified private property as a consequence of sin, arguing that it provides a necessary corrective to human greed and unchecked dominion. Gradually, they began to adopt more positive views, focusing on the ways in which private property encourages individuals to care for and cultivate resources. At the same time, however, they also claim that private property can only be justified by reference to the original purpose for material goods, namely the maintenance of human life. Aquinas expressed a widely held view when he wrote, provisions of human right cannot restrict natural right or divine right. Now, according to the natural order instituted by divine providence, lower things are directed to this end that human necessities are to be supplied by them. And therefore, the division and appropriation of material things which proceeds from human right does not prevent human necessities from being supplied by things of this kind. If the need be so urgent and evident that it is manifest that the immediate need must be relieved by whatever things occur, then someone can licitly take another's things to relieve his need, whether openly or in secret. Nor does such an action properly have the character of theft or robbery. Early in the next century, acting in the context of acrimonious debates over the meaning of evangelical poverty, 
Pope John XXII took the further step of affirming the existence of a natural right to private property. And this is the starting point for Pope Leo's affirmation of the teaching. And what is more, no pope and few theologians since have felt free to deny it point blank. However, Leo's teachings on private property began to be qualified almost immediately. His successor, Pius VI, sets the tone when he says, first then, let it be considered as certain and established that neither Leo nor those theologians have ever denied or questioned the twofold character of ownership, usually called individual or social, as it regards either separate persons or the common good. For they have always unanimously maintained that nature, rather than the, or rather the creator himself, has given us the right of private ownership, not only that individuals may be able to provide for themselves and their families, but also that the goods which the creator destined for the entire family of mankind may, through this institution, truly serve this purpose. Pius goes on to say that it is the responsibility of the state to regulate the use of property in accordance with the demands of the common good. There are limits to what political authority can do, of course, but the scope of state power in this respect is nonetheless extensive, and Pius adds that property owners should actually thank political authorities for their wise regulation. I will not go through, through subsequent papal statements in any detail, but if you examine them, you will see that they follow the trajectory of Pius's remarks. The right to private property is generally affirmed, but it is also qualified by appeals to the common good and the natural purpose of material things. This is one aspect of, of Catholic social teaching that remains more or less consistent, even as its focus shifts from workers' rights to international structures. To take the most striking later example, Paul VI asserted in Populorum Progressio that private property does not constitute for anyone an absolute and unconditioned right, and goes on to say that if certain landed estates impede the general prosperity because they are extensive, unused, or poorly used, or because they bring hardship to peoples or are detrimental to the interests of the country, the common good sometimes demands their expropriation. Subsequently, John Paul II defends the legitimacy of individual ownership but he actually stopped short of calling it a right. Finally, in an interview with the Italian journal La Stampa in 2015, Pope Francis was asked if he agreed with Paul VI's reservations about private property. He replied, not only are they still valid, but the more time goes on, the more I find they have been proved by experience. So far, it may seem that Catholic social teachings on this point have little to offer. Beyond suggestive, but inconclusive remarks on the limits of property rights. Certainly, the question of whether private property is a natural right needs to be reconsidered systematically and at some length. Yet we do not need to resolve the status of private property in order to draw some more immediate and useful lessons. The first is simply the ambiguity of ownership, the close connection between control of goods and income and control of other people, and the need to preserve the balance of power between those who enjoy material wealth and those who do not. Secondly, the general principle that God intends the material creation to serve human needs is not limited in scope to a consideration of property <laughs> rights. It can also serve as a criterion for fairness and justice in other economic arrangements, including critically the standards for a just wage. This line of thinking appears in the encyclicals we are considering, but it is developed at great length by the American moral theologian John Ryan, popularly known as Father New Deal, for his influence on the Roosevelt administration. Ryan wrote his first book on wage justice, and he then returns to the topic in his magnum opus, Distributive Justice. He argues there that need, appropriately qualified and balanced by other considerations, is a valid and indispensable as a partial standard. He develops his argument on the basis of three fundamental principles. The first is, is the familiar claim that God created the earth for the sustenance of all his children. Therefore, all persons are equal in their inherent claims upon the bounty of nature. The second is that the inherent right of access in the earth is conditioned upon 
and becomes actually valid through the expenditure of useful labor. These principles taken together lead him to conclude that those who are in present in control of the opportunities of the earth are obliged to permit reasonable access to these opportunities by persons who are willing to work. When anyone who is willing to work is denied the exercise of this right, he is no longer treated as the moral and juridical equal of his fellows. He is regarded as inherently inferior to them, as a mere instrument to their convenience, and those who exclude him are virtually taking the position that their rights to the common gifts of the creator are inherently superior to his birthright. Ryan goes on to say that the worker's claim to access can only be met by a family wage, sufficient to support both a man and his family in security and reasonable comfort. Clearly, Ryan's conception of a family wage presupposes a particular kind of family. But that fact should not distract us from the larger point. In order to live decent human lives, and especially to support a family, workers need access to something more than a subsistent wage. They need enough money to support themselves and their dependents, together with hours and working conditions which provide the time and stability needed to meet family and social responsibilities. The ideal of a family wage can accommodate many different models of family life, but Ryan's basic point I think is still valid. That is, the right to access implies that men and women have a right to the means for a full life, not just the bare minimum for survival. More generally, the principle that all men and women have a claim to, on access to the material means of survival offers a powerful starting point for a constructive critique of an economic system. This principle is potentially so fruitful because we can begin to apply it even before we work out the meaning of ownership and entitlement in contemporary finance-driven societies. Structures of production, distribution, entitlement, and ownership are not simply given by natural or historical necessities, and they cannot be just presupposed as the starting points for moral analysis. These structures are themselves the products of social choices, and they are subject to moral critique. To what extent do the productive and financial arrangements of a society open up possibilities for productive work on reasonable and humane terms? And correlatively, to what extent do these arrangements serve the interests of those who own or manage productive resources at the expense of working men and women? Do they promote freedom, social mobility and respect, or constraint, social exclusion and disregard? These and similar questions can serve as starting points for identifying injustices within the systems of production and distribution and acting accordingly. At the same time, we need to guard against the assumption that theoretical reflection alone will solve our problems. The churches, including my own Catholic church, have a commendable record of supporting labor activism, even though this record is also mixed in some respects. We would do re well to revive a spirit of support and cooperation that once existed between organized Christianity and organized labor. And this brings me to my final and briefer point. The right to organize, to form unions and other kinds of workers' associations, and to confront employers through strikes and other mechanisms have been consistently affirmed by popes, church leaders, and theologians ever since Rerum Novarum. Most fundamentally, the right to form unions is grounded in a general right of association, but over time, the moral values at stake were expanded to include the right to try to better one's condition, and the claim to exercise a kind of economic democracy. At the same time, the right to form unions and to engage in collective bargaining has taken on the status of a piety, often cited but not given much attention. This collective inattention needs to change. And in fact, I'm beginning to see signs that it is starting to change, uh, at, at least in some small but promising ways. In an earlier version of this paper, I commented on the past and the future of organized labor in this country in far more detail than I plan to do tonight. You'll be happy to hear. We can certainly talk about these matters, but they are not the primary concern of the church considered as such. The ongoing tasks of organizing and collective action are the responsibilities first and foremost of working men and women themselves. 
and they will determine the shape of workers' organizations in the future. The task of the church is just what it has always been, to preach the gospel in such a way as to draw out its implications for personal and social life. I am suggesting that priests and other con congregational leaders should once again preach on these questions, preferably with a specific reference to the just claims of the working class and the purpose and the limits of ownership. In addition, the churches should provide opportunities for working men and women to come together to study and reflect on their experiences in the light of Christian principles of justice and the purpose of material goods. Parishes and congregations can provide invaluable resources for those members of their congregation who want to exercise their right to organize. We need to retrieve the dangerous memory of Catholic labor schools set up by individuals and religious orders uh, in the years after World War II to offer training in organizing skills, parliamentary procedure, and other related topics. All these are offered as suggestions, but as I say, to some extent they are beginning to happen and more can be done. What has happened once can happen again if we have the imagination to envision it and the commitment to carry it through. We find it difficult to talk about class in this country, and Leo's focus on the working class can make for uncomfortable reading. Yet Leo presents class in such a way as to promote an understanding of one's place in systems of production, distribution, and cultural variables. Arguably, we cannot make progress on issues of justice for American workers without some such process of self-recognition and self-empowerment. Even more fundamentally, ancient Christian teachings on the ultimate purpose of material goods and the ambiguities of ownership offer the basis of a powerful critique of current systems of production and the uses of financial <laughs> instruments to control our lives. These teachings are part of the patrimony of the Christian community, and we should once again bring them out to place them at the service of those who can most effectively make use of them. Thank you. Hi, Andrew Ogletree. Um, you've mentioned that uh, that we, as people who are potentially the church, preaching to and and to engage with people of uh, working class, but isn't it also our responsibility to actually speak truth to power in terms of people at the one tenth of one percent to say, "Look, you own you you control sixty percent of the world's wealth." you have a major responsibility. And I'm thinking from a medieval period, you know, that's why the, all the churches were built because they had such, I mean, in a sad way, terrible guilt. But isn't that also our responsibility? Oh, yes, I agree completely. And if I suggested anything else, uh, I, I, I don't want to leave that impression. All I want to avoid here is the perennial danger on, that I think we always face as members of the educated class of doing good for others. Um, you know, I, I don't think that's our role. I think we should talk together with others to see how we can sort of do good together. Um, but yes, I do think we should try to challenge this more directly and forthrightly than we have. Um, I, I think there are a lot of ways to do that. I, I won't go on at this point, but uh, I, I do think there are a lot of ways in which that could be done, and I'm very much for doing it. Up here, to My name is Jane Abbott-Smith. I'm a PhD student in religious ethics. And my question is about subsidiarity and justice. Um, the principle of subsidiarity, especially as developed by Pope Pius in, in Quad Quadragesimo Anno, really emphasizes the importance of lifting up the agency, the, the um, activity of the individual in the small communities. Um, at the same time, justice seems to uh, really emphasize the need for a safety net, as you call it. and um, to, to make room for the just claims of the working class on the state. And I'm wondering if you see these two goals as distinct 
and competing or as unified and cooperative? And if they are unified, kind of two parts of the same ideal, how would you describe that ideal? I would hesitate to call subsidiarity an ideal. Um, and my reason for hesitating is simply that I think that subsidiarity in, in our discourse today is yoked to a certain anti-statism uh, that is not going to be helpful in this context. I mean, there are, certain, there are levels of this problem that can only be addressed at the international level, let alone the national level. Um, and so I worry a little bit sometimes when we, when we put so much emphasis on subsidiarity that we give the impression that people you know, can come together in small group discussion groups and work it all out. That being said, I also think there is an important place for what I, th I understand subsidiarity to mean. And, and that's why at the end I talk about the churches, and here I mean not only the Catholic Church, but the churches generally, giving real and effective support uh, to individuals who want to come together to organize. Uh, Whatever else happens, I think that working people need to find ways to take back their collective power, and there's no way to do that except by starting on small scales. Uh, and that would be where I would most immediately locate the ideal of subsidiarity. Thank you. John Collins and Kathy. Hello, John. Hey, hello, John. <laughs> <laughs> this was another former colleague. Uh, Jean, when and why did the language of rights become important in the Catholic Church? In the 12th century. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, in the 12th century, and it was important, be, uh, the language of, a, well, there's a lot to be said about this, and I'm not going to say most of it. Yeah, but, uh, the language of, I mean, to, to cut to the chase, the language of a right as an individual possession or an individual moral capacity starts to be intimated in the 12th century and becomes pretty explicit in the 13th century. Uh, it's important um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's important because it's a reflection theologically of a set of claims about the ways in which the human person uh, as an individual operates autonomously through divinely in, uh, endowed principles. It's also important because it provides a moral and juridical way of talking about the independent moral authority of individuals. And it's important that it's framed in the language of a right, a use, because historically the use was always the, the foundation for making a law. So when you say that individuals have a use, a right, you're saying that individuals have some kind of juridical claim, not just a moral claim, but a, but a claim that is in some way publicly authoritative and ought to be recognized. Kathy Tanner, and then here, and then here. <laughs> Thanks, Jean, for that. That was a fabulous lecture. I uh, learned a lot from it. I agree with you entirely about, uh, from what I gather of what you're saying about the importance of Catholic social teaching, especially the selective reading that you're giving of it and seem very powerfully uh, developed. But uh, it also seems that the, you know, these are historically conditioned documents that have some severe <laughs> limitations. Um, I mean, I'm speaking from a Protestant point of view now, but uh, that the historical limitations should be recognized as such and should, you know, it would allow for a bit more punch to the, the criticism of the current con condition in ways that I think would make your own presentation more consistent. Because you said to begin with that this is an exploitative system. And to me, that means not simply that you've got some nice hierarchy with everybody playing their roles, and if only they were given a dignified uh, you know, appreciation for the roles they're playing, but they're being exploited. And, exp and being exploited is not a regular old role, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, it should be, it seems to me that the criti criticism should be much more pointed because this is not a hierarchy. This is not a body politic. This is a system in which the vast majority of uh, working people are simply being exploited systematically for profit. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Kathy, and let me try to make two points clear. I certainly realize that these are historically conditioned documents. One reason I think they're valuable is precisely that. The historical conditions they reflect have come around again. Um, at, least to at least to enough of an extent 
that what they say once again has relevance and bind. Uh, and it has a relevance of a kind that was obscured uh, in the years of prosperity and relative equality. And that's why we dropped that strain of our teaching. So I think the historical conditioning is a part of actually what makes them relevant again. Uh, my other point with respect to roles, um, I think you're uncomfortable with my identification of the salience of social class and the importance of roles. Um, and all I would say to that is, I think for the popes themselves, and certainly for me, the point of identifying roles and class structures is precisely to give a moral critique of the ways in which those structures are construed and the ways in which people live their lives in this context. The point is you can't make a moral critique unless you have some specificity and you have some idea of what it is you're critiquing, what has gone wrong, and what might go right. Just as you can't begin to do a moral critique of marriage relations unless you think there is some kind of institution of marriage which generates roles and then you talk about that. So uh, I'm not saying that a focus on class and roles should lead us to accept whatever the functioning uh, of these may turn out to be. I, I, I'm saying just the contrary. I'm saying once we identify this, certain things have a moral salience for us that we otherwise would be likely to dismiss or obscure. Yeah. Sure. It's not like you have a present system that structurally could be used appropriately in which everybody working could be treated in a dignified manner and, and paid uh, a working, uh, you know, living wage. That's not the issue here. The issue is that the structure is systematically exploitative. And, uh, you know, the, so there has to be a structural, very specific uh, criticism of the system as a whole rather than saying, oh, well, if, if only people weren't being exploited in their work, working uh, lives, which would, could otherwise be dignified, because that's not how it works. Okay. All right, two more questions, and then we'll, we'll go to wine and cheese. Hi, my name is Sam. I'm a STM student, and uh, I saw the word anger or angry in your lecture, so I knew I had to be here for it because uh, I'm active duty military chaplain. I get, get paid pretty well. However, my electric bill uh, in August, I live on a three-bedroom apartment, family of five. My electric bill was $390, so I was angry. And the next month, it was $350, and the electric company assured me that I was at least saving money because it went down a little bit, but I was still angry. Uh, but uh, you make this uh, statement here, which, which I heartily agree with. You said... Um, the working class's share in prosperity is not commensurate with the contribution to that prosperity. And, and I heartily agree with that. Um, however, who, who determines that and when we determine if that is actually true? How do we determine the degrees to which that is true or isn't or what that would look like? For instance, like Mark Zuckerberg inventing and founding Facebook and then he's got workers. How, how do we define and, and, and parse that out? Well, if you're asking me what, how we define what that looks like in terms of the numbers, um, I actually did some checking on this. Um, you know, people figure these things in the ways that they get evidence for the econ economic uh, growth or otherwise. And so these are the basic figures. From 1973, when the, the status of the working class started to decline, until 2016, uh, pro productivity rose by 73.7%. That's the measured economic production per hour. The hourly pay of workers rose by 12.5%. You know, now you cannot tell me that's a force of nature. Um, what did happen to change this, or what happened to bring this about? I think a lot of things happened at once. Um, one thing, and I, you know, the effects of all these things are debated, and I'm a theologian, and I'm not an economist, but I'm going to tell you what seemed to me to be most important. First of all, we pulled out of the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1971. What was the Bretton Woods Agreement, and why do we care? It was an agreement set up after World War II, which set up an international system of finance and control of money, uh, which set currency exchange rates at a fixed rate, 
and which also put very strong restrictions which were enforced globally on what you might call aggressive and predatory financing. Uh, the laws domestically in this country similarly put very strong controls on financing and they put a firewall up between banking and investment. Uh, unions were very strong at this period. Um, trade le legislation was set up in such a way as to give more weight to protecting domestic industries and less to a, what's the so-called and miscalled free trade. So there's a whole series of things we did which had the effect of allowing and in some cases forcing uh, capital to work within the system of, of the country, and not just this country, but countries generally, and to reinvest what they were doing to keep production at home. Wor workers had some strength to demand higher wages. There was a whole system of conditions here. And what happened is that beginning in the 70s, they all started to go away. Um, and I think that's the story. And again, what we have done, we can undo. Um, it's just going to take a lot of political will and probably a lot of time. Our last question, and the, the, there will be a chance for you to ask Gene questions at the reception. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Jalen and I'm a prospective student. So in thinking about how class oppression is one of the ways in which racism and white supremacy works to disproportionately disadvantage people of color in regard to class. I was wondering if uh, Catholic social teaching has a particular way of thinking about how racial reconciliation or being an advocate for racial justice can allow for, can allow, well I guess can make sure that in our fight to end class struggle, we're making sure that everybody is free rather than just a certain sect of people being free. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Let me say a couple of things. Um, I, you notice how I always like, my, my questions are like mushrooms, they sort of grow. Um, let me say a couple of things about that. First, I think the Catholic teachings have some things to say about this. I do not think this is our strong suit. Um, it's not that, that what we say is particularly problematic or bad. We just don't go into the issue with the depth that we should. Um, and here's a point, I mean, I talk about an ecumenical conversation. Um, the free church traditions are far ahead. Uh, and, and the non-denominational traditions, you know, his, the, both the historically black churches, church and uh, these traditions more generally. I think that's where the really cutting edge thinking is done because that's where the cutting edge practice was done. Uh, you know, I mean, if you look, if you ask yourself, where do you get the traditions of religiously inspired preaching and organizing on this? Those are the churches that do it. Um, I think in key part because there, the organizational structure lets these kinds of initiatives emerge and be valorized religiously. And, and that's something the Catholic structure can't do. Um, so here's a point at which I really think ecumenical conversation would be very, very important. Um, since you mentioned racism, I want to add something else. It's a bit off topic, but I hope, uh, but I think it's worth saying. Uh, you know, we, we talk about class and race, and this is a very combustible topic because of the racism of the, of the working class. Uh, the observation I would make that I think needs to be immediately brought to attention here is that racism is not a class problem in this country, it's a national problem. People do attitudinal studies on this. You know, the people, but I mean I could get the information if I needed to. Um, they, they look at the attitudes of people who, are, when they're evaluating, say, a resume for a job, or they're evaluating someone who's trying to rent their house or something all kinds of ways of measuring social attitudes. The fact is that racism is found in every level of society. And it's found at about the same levels. So when we talk about challenging racism and class structures together, you know, I think we have to realize that what we're doing is not, that what we need to talk about is not so much challenging the racism of the white working class so that white and black working class can work together, but more fundamentally challenging the racism of the whole society and indicting that as a part of a pattern of, of blindness and exclusion 
uh, that, that at the same time takes the kinds of class oppression I'm talking about as inevitable and, as Pius XI said, uh, something to be met by charity alone.